So he is very, very serious on whenever we train, we train with intent and intensity. Hello, you're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio episode 572 with today's guest, Dr. Nikolai Lee. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, I'm your host on the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where we love traditional martial arts. It's why we do what we do. And there's a good chance that that's why you're here checking out what we do. If you're a traditional martial artist, if you're passionate about the arts, you can go to whistlekick.com and see all the things that we are doing for you, the traditional martial artists throughout the world. You're going to find a store over there. And yeah, we sell some stuff because making this show and the other things we do, it's not free. So by selling you some stuff, it helps offset the costs. And you can even save 15% on anything over there with the code PODCAST15 and lets us know that the people buying things love the show. Helps us understand where to spend our money in the future. Now this show gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where you're going to find every episode that we've ever done with photos and videos and links and transcripts and all kinds of good stuff to help give you more context on the guests and the subjects that we bring to you each week. We bring you two episodes a week. And we're looking to connect and educate and entertain all of you. And if that means something to you, yeah, you can buy something and support us that way. You could also support our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. You give as little as two bucks a month and we're going to start giving back stuff to you above and beyond the things that we already do. The more you spend, the more we give you. Whether you realize it or not, today's guest has actually been on the show. He just never said anything. Today's guest, Dr. Nikolai Lee has been a passionate martial artist for a large portion of his life, and he grew up in a martial arts tradition. Well, he's here to talk about that and his time in health, medicine, however we want to call it. We talk about that. We talk about a lot of different things, and it's a great conversation with someone that I consider a friend, and I had a lot of fun. So here we go. Dr. Lee, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Jeremy. How's it going? Great. How are you? I'm great, man. Great. Excited for today. Yeah, me too. We've been talking about this for a little while. And, you know, you you hold the distinction in that you've kind of been on the show before, but not. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I don't know that there's any, there, there might be one or two other people who can say that. And the listeners right now are going, uh, Jeremy, what, stop with the inside jokes. Stop with the vagueness. <laughs> what the heck's going on? And the first thing, and, and, and I'm going to phrase it this way, because we have a little bit of a, of, of a background with each other. And because we we talked about it beforehand let's get this out of the way doctor <laughs> let's unpack that for a minute because that's not a title that you see used very often in martial arts context yeah yeah let's so go. okay so let's see since 2012 and actually one year before that i was working as an emt i was working as a paramedic and i absolutely loved the job it was a lot of fun a lot of crazy moments, as you can imagine. Mm. Um, but, you know, kind of a newsflash for most people, the pay is horrible. Um, and the lifestyle can be a little rough. So I switched over to the hospital life. And I was like, I really like working in the ER. It was a lot of fun. Um, and I was like, you know, I, I want to do something, you know, a little bit more. Not that I didn't think paramedic was important, but I just I wanted to be the one making the calls. You know, so I start deciding where do I want to go from here? And I talked to a lot of people on both sides of the fence, and I thought about going MD, although I think medicine is incredibly important and it very much has its place and we need it. As a martial artist, the holistic medicine aspect really kind of spoke to me, mm-hmm. you know, and growing and I'm sure we'll get into this, but growing up around the martial arts, that was kind of ingrained in me. So I start looking at the chiropractic and, you know, you hear these stories growing up about, you know, their quacks and this and that. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff I won't go into there, but I start doing my own research, you know, somebody who's medically minded and I'm looking at all this different research of chiropractic and I'm thinking, wow, this is kind of cool. So I call up Daytona State. I'm I'm down here in Florida. So I call up Daytona State and I say, hey, I want to go to Palmer. I've heard it's a really good school. 
um, what do I need to get in? So I send them, they say, you know, send me your transcripts. So I send them the transcripts and they said, yeah, so you need a bachelor's degree to get in. Cool. I'm like, in what? And she said, anything. I'm like, you're kidding me. <laughs> so we looked at the transcript and they said, yeah, so you can get a, a bachelor's in supervision and management. It's like a business degree. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, sure. So I did that. I really wanted to get going in school. I was tired of being a paramedic, tired of working my butt off for no money. Um, I was working two other jobs at the same time and decided to go back to school. So at this point, I had three jobs and a full-time load. Knocked out the bachelor's degree in six months, and I had to get special permission from the dean to do that. Ended up in chiropractic school after all that. And then in September, um, amidst Corona, I have graduated and am now in practice. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of work. Thank you. So when we talk about the title thing, I, I'm definitely not a man of titles. You know, I, I don't think that somebody is defined by their title. It simply, for me, it kind of describes what they do in their position, you know, and we talked about this a little bit earlier before the show that, you know, in the school, I am senior master Lee. If you and I were to see each other on the street, I'm Nikolai. If we were to see each other at the practice, I'm doctor. So growing up, I had to kind of get used to using multiple different titles for the same person, depending on where they were. Yeah. You know, so for me, it's it's more about just describing what they do, and it shouldn't be a definition of who they are. So I agree. Yeah, we I were agree. we were a little confused on which which thing to use here. So that's yeah. how we landed on doctor. <laughs> well, and the thing that I find interesting about calling you doctor is that within the martial arts, we have it's not across the board, but we have a really strong thread that pops up from time to time with this notion that if you have the ability to hurt, you should also have the ability to heal. Mm -hmm. And just within my experience, that tends to show up more so with practitioners of Chinese martial arts. Yes. And I can't say that it's exclusive to that, but that's where I'm used to hearing it when, you know, when we, when we talk to people on the show. Mm -hmm. And I think that Yes, this is a martial arts setting, and and I think no doctor may not be the most uh, correct way to introduce you for a martial arts show, but I think it says so much about who you are, and I think it leads us into not only the conversation that we had, but I think it gives the listeners some context for the other things that we're going to talk about, and I think that that's really as you kind of said it. I'm going to say it in a different way. That's all the title is. It helps us frame our reference for who is it we're interacting with. Mm -hmm. If I say, you know, within Japanese traditions, if I say Hanshi, I'm going to conduct myself. Maybe I shouldn't, but I am. I'm going to conduct myself a little differently with Hanshi, <laughs> somebody, versus Sensei, somebody else. Yes. Because that title equates to, or at least it should, much more experience. And thus, I would assume knowledge and within most martial traditions we tend to equate that to a level of respect yes very much so so that's where we are very much so and i think you know you'll you'll tend to use that title like if somebody really respects you they will make it a point a po oh, excuse me they'll make it a point to call you you know sir or ma'am for instance or mister you know rather than calling somebody hey joe or saying, hey, Mr. Smith, there's there's a big difference there in respect. And that's that's kind of a cool point you made. Yeah. And I and I think <sighs> lately I'm seeing a lot of stuff, and actually I've seen some stuff uh as a result of Cobra Kai. You know, we don't <laughs> oh, date yeah. stamp these things, but Cobra Kai season three came out a few days ago and people are chewing through it. And so there's a lot of conversation in martial arts discussions around cobra kai and you know the title the, the topic of titles is coming mm -hmm. up and and there's there's new discussion and argument and 
you know, of course, everybody's right. And, uh, you know, the only reason I, I mentioned that is you brought up respect. I can call you and, and, and I, I'll make this example. I could call you Nikolai with the utmost respect. You could hear it in my voice. Mm -hmm. I could also call you doctor sarcastically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Respect doesn't necessarily equate to the title used, but uh, it should guide it, I think. Yeah, I would agree. Now let's let's get off of that. (laughs) This is a good conversation, but let's get off that because I, I feel like I'm talking far too much and i'm really uncomfortable with it in the context of this show it's not a thursday episode this is an interview so let's let's do it let's do you know the question i'm going to ask when did it start when when did martial arts pop into your life so this is interesting um you've had a couple people on your show with some similar backgrounds uh i was not one of those who you know at 10 or 12 or whatever the age may be their parents decided to put them in martial arts, which I think is a great thing, by the way, for the development of the kid. But I grew up around martial arts from day one. Um, Our association, uh, it's the American Hot Keto Alliance. Um, I was, I'm 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 a youngster to a lot of people. So I was born in 89. The association was created in 1993. So I've, I've grown up around this since the beginning, essentially. It was created by my grandfather, Grandmaster Jimmy Brown, and my father, Grandmaster Jimmy Forelli. So from the time that I was a little kid, I was constantly around it. You know, I was constantly around classes and seminars, and my mother trained, my father trained. Uh, once my father remarried, my stepmother also trained. I mean, it, it was just a huge part of my life. Um, but I never trained in the beginning. Um, whenever my father and my stepmother were living in Texas at the time, um, I'm sure a lot of people remember September 11th. Uh, that, was, that was a massive day that changed a lot of lives, um, regardless of the political schemes or all the different stories that have come out of it um it definitely changed the world and for me that was the first major event that happened historically you know my in my lifetime that was the very first major huge one um and i vividly remember i was i was in sixth grade and i was in miss williams english or uh, language arts class the principal came over the intercom and ordered everybody to turn on their TVs. And it was right whenever the planes had gone into the Trade Center. And, you know, we're, we're kids and we're watching this happening. And, you know, it's hard to understand the world when you're that age. You know, you think you do, but you really don't. So we're, we're watching this happen and we're trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Well, like I said a while ago, my dad and my stepmother were living in Texas. They were living over in uh, Richardson, which is near Dallas, um, Dallas Fort Worth area. And I was flying over there um, usually once a month by myself uh, to go visit them. The first couple of times I had, you know, stewardesses help me and stuff, but I kind of got to where I was pretty good at navigating the airports. Um, so I was flying over by myself and they'd, you know, meet me at the airport type thing. And mind you, this is you know, 2001 area that I'm flying back and forth. Well, the bombings, I mean, excuse me, uh, September 11th really hit me personally because I'm thinking, my gosh, you know, I've been flying on these planes. And And, and you're 12? Roughly. (laughs) And I'm, I'm like, I've been flying on these planes. And I'm like, what if that was me? You know, what if, what if I was the one on that plane? And it really kind of stayed with me. It really bothered me. I'm like, you know, I wonder, did any of these people fight back? You know, what was going on? So I decided that, you know, if I was going to be on this plane, and it could happen anywhere other than a plane, but that's just what stuck with me. You know, I wanted to be able to fight back. And... If it was, say, a terrorist attack, 
you know, could they win? Absolutely. But I was going to give them a fight. And that's, that's kind of where I was. So I told my dad, um, you know, I thought about it for a while and I, I told him, I was like, you know, listen, I, I really want to start training. You know, I, I want to be prepared. It, it had nothing to do with being around other kids or wanting to go to tournaments or anything. You know, because if, if something happened while I was on that plane, you know, and I could prevent somebody from dying or, you know, thousands of people from getting hurt or even just, you know, the person next to me, I wanted to be prepared. Um, and I kept can thinking I about question? it. Kept, can I, can I yeah, yeah. And I hope I'm not going to derail you too much. Maybe just a little. Um, <laughs> as you know, as listeners know, when, when I hear people talk, I, I pick out nuances in the way they describe things. And, and what I'm hearing you talk about is not keeping yourself safe. You're talking about keeping other people safe. Yes. And that's not a typical mindset for a 12-year-old. Do you, do you know where that came from? Um, kind of. Uh, my my parents divorced fairly young, um, and I think from there on, and I, I had a great relationship with both of my parents, even though they were not together. Um, I think I became very protective of them, so it was kind of like protecting, like not not that they needed some twelve year old to protect them, but I think it was more of protecting what you have because that means everything to you. If, if that makes sense. And I think that's probably where it developed. Okay. Yeah. Please continue. Um, let's see, where was I? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, March, 2002, my stepmom um, was a, at the time she was a biochemical engineer. Um, working for a company called CH2M Hill in Texas. That's how they ended up there. And she kind of decided, you know, that really wasn't who she wanted to be anymore. You know, with the engineering world, you over time, you end up doing a lot more paperwork than you do active mm. type, type building and whatnot. Um, and she just wasn't really feeling it anymore. Um, so... After her doing research, she decided to go to chiropractic school. Um, and then they moved to Port Orange, where actually they moved to Orlando. Excuse me. Um, she started going to school in Port Orange. She was commuting. So that's how they ended up back in Florida. And then the following September, September uh, 2002, and I was, I was 13 at the time, um, that's whenever I finally started training. Um, I would come to my dad's house every other weekend. I live primarily with my mom. Um, I'm originally from Lake City, Florida, which is in North Florida. And it's about two and a half hours um, north of Orlando. So I was traveling back and forth. Um, they would come to get me and take me home and everything. I, w I wasn't driving at 13, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Should hope not. Yeah. Well, you never know. Um it is Florida. It is Florida. You, you know, crazy things happen. But uh, yeah, so I would come down here and I would only be able to train every two weeks. You know, people are, are kind of spoiled and we're kind of used to the fact that, oh, we get to go to class multiple nights a week. Up in Lake City, there wasn't much. There was a Taekwondo school. Um, although I respect the art, that was not what I wanted. It, it just, it was not what I was looking for. So basically I was training by myself as a child. Um, and then having a hardcore training session session every two weeks, you know, three hours South of me. Um, so it was a pretty slow pace. Uh, you know, there's only so much you can do when you're by yourself and you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's kind of the short version of how I ended up training. Um, but it, you know, if I can real quick, you know, there's a lot of people Please. out there who you may not feel like you have a story, 
you know, you you may think that your story is just run of the bill, run of the mill. You know, you started training when you were six or seven, and you just kept going since, or you found it as an adult. But you think there's nothing special about it, but in all reality, there's a lot special about it. You know, you you don't realize the kind of connection that you can have with another person until you talk to that person. You know, for years I thought that my story was nothing special, and I'm sure 2020 made a lot of people think about their lives. And it kind of showed me that, you know, September 11th was a big day in history. I mean, we, we still, you know, spread remembrance in that and what, what happened. And that's really what kind of spiked me training. That's really what got me there. So if you guys feel like you're, you know, you don't have a story, I'm sure if you take a second and think about what got you there, why did you start training? Why do you keep training? You'll realize that you have a lot bigger story than you think. I agree. I think everyone does. I think we get so wrapped up in the normalcy of our own lives, our own why, that we forget that if we present the details in the right way, if we're honest with ourselves, you know, we all live these exceptional lives. Mm -hmm. And that exceptional life may not be every aspect of it, but it's a moment here and there. You know, it's the time when, you know, somehow the car missed you and you didn't die. Yeah. Or you weren't on the plane that crashed mm -hmm. or, or, or. Mm -hmm. And I think historically we do, we do a bad job of, of recognizing that exceptionalism in our own stories. And I'm glad that you pointed that out. Yes, sir. And when we were talking about titles. And I brought up the connection between Chinese martial arts and, and my observation of the frequency with which Chinese martial arts practitioners learn some kind of healing modality. You, you, you kind of chimed in there, and I'm wondering if that resonates for you. Was that at all the impetus for you becoming an EMT and a paramedic? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So... The paramedic and the EMT was a little different story. Um, but I think if you look at the whole thing as in a healing art, you know, so take EMT, paramedic, chiropractic, anything in order to heal somebody or, or do something. Um, martial arts and medical are really the same thing. It's just different applications of it. So like for... For chiropractic, for example, if you think about you walk into a room and there is a light on the ceiling and there's a light switch on the wall. If you turn on that light switch, that light bulb should come on. If it doesn't, then that tells you one of three things. There's a problem with the bulb, the wiring, or the switch. So our job as chiropractors is to figure out why is that bulb not coming on? And how can we fix the issue? So, you know, if, if somebody has, you know, a little inflammation around a nerve root or a lot of inflammation around a nerve root that can control one of the organ systems or control musculoskeletal, like, you know, a muscle spasm, or if they're having, you know, pain shooting down their leg or they can't feel their legs, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, our job is to figure out what is causing that and how can we fix it. You know, a lot of people think that all we do is adjust the spine. Um, in a lot of states, including Florida, we're primary care providers. Um, so we can treat naturally the entire body. Now, what's cool about that is that that directly connects with martial arts, specifically for me, hot keto. And hot keto, our job is to learn how to, and I, I don't mean the um, moral compass aspect of it, but physically, <laughs> we are looking to do harm on some level if we're having to use hop keto. That doesn't mean that we're dislocating a joint or breaking a bone. That just means that we learn, you know, if you hit here, it hurts in a certain way. If you do a certain type of joint lock, the pain's coming from here. And I make it a point whenever I'm teaching my students that, to explain to them anatomically, why does this work? 
So really, it's it's the same thing. You know, whenever we're doing an adjustment as a chiropractor, I'm putting a joint back into place to work normally. Whereas a hop keto practitioner, I'm taking the joint out of place to not work correctly. So it's it's really the same thing from two different sides. Is that making sense? <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, we, we talked before the show listeners, I'm, I'm sure you guys put that together. There's always like, almost always, there's kind of a pre-show, you know, and I mentioned that I've, I've had some close people in my life that are chiropractors and you still have that kind of new shine from Cairo school of being very particular in the way that you present things about what you do. And I'm finding that really fun. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of the reason for that is because, you know, it, it's starting to, to diminish now because there, for years, right. there was a huge separation of natural health care and medical health care. Like they just, they did not get along. They did not play well together. And, and I, I think you even used the word quack at some point, you know, some people. Yeah still see chiropractic and as as fringe um medical care yeah and you know i'm not one of those people but there are all sorts of different variants of chiropractic care yes there is there are all sorts of different martial arts and you know what i'm sure that any of you could point to some martial art and say i don't know about that one over there and you can say the same thing about some flavors of chiro oh yeah that is 100 percent true you know there are good chiros and bad chiros there's good mds and bad mds it's it's it has to do with the practitioner not the art you know and where where have we where have we talked about that before oh yeah on this show <laughs> like every huh. week oh huh. <laughs> look at that yeah and honestly man it's most of the time it's because people don't really understand what we do they they believe what they've been told but they don't understand why you know, so that's that's a big part of it. But I think, you know, I was medically trained before I ever became a chiropractor. So I've got the medical mindset, but I like to treat it naturally. And I'm pretty objective about my findings. You know, so it's it's kind of a cool blend. Like I'm glad that God took me the long way around and maybe a paramedic first, because I've had this exposure to a massive amount of healthcare that a lot of people never get. You know, I didn't just go through and I'm not, you know, swinging chickens and voodoo <laughs> dolls and all that junk. I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm medical testing with natural treatment. I've yeah, never so. been to a doctor that swung chickens, but I, I think I would thank <laughs> this for the story. That sounds like a good time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, but one I, of the things I find... That's true of martial arts, too. I mean... Mm, yeah, I've, I've not been to a school that swung chickens. You know, I haven't either, so, but it could happen. <laughs> have I told the goose story on this show? I don't think so. Uh, apologies if I have told the goose story and people have heard this, but if you haven't heard it, I'm going to share it because it it's really darn close to a swinging chicken story. So, um, and I'll be brief because wow, how are you getting me to talk so much? This is weird. You're man. welcome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, grew up in rural Maine. My mother had a business partner who owned a farm. We were visiting. I was probably four the farm had a goose. Geese are the meanest animals on earth. And this yes. one was one of the worst. Yes. There was one person on the farm, one of the farmhands who this goose liked and it would let him pet her. Everybody else had to stay away and she would chase you. So the routine was we would pull up to the farmhouse. Do you see the goose? We'd look for the goose. Didn't see the goose. And, you know, this is, this is old. This is, this is how old, you know, this is because I'm, I'm like four or five years old in the front seat of the car, not in a, any kind of booster seat. Mm-hmm. That gives you an idea of the age. And we don't see the goose get out. Goose comes out of the bushes is in between us and the door. My mother doesn't even think I don't even, I'm pretty sure she hadn't even been training at that point, picks me up by the arms and hauls off and golf clubs me through the goose feet to the <laughs> goose's head, knocks the goose goose runs away go in the house uh the, the, the husband's there at the kitchen table trying not to die laughing oh my gosh you know many of you <laughs> describe yourself as weapons you are weapons i have literally been used as a weapon by another person oh my gosh that is great <laughs> <laughs> so now i'm going to try to pull it back from that ridiculousness <laughs> thank you for sharing that though that is course, spot on i love it very thank you for indulging me yeah 
Very appropriate now, to the story. I like it. I, I agree. I agree. It's <laughs> rare that that has a a, a, a germane segue into yeah. conversation. Got to use it. But I use it whenever possible because it's the best story ever. Yes. <laughs> when martial artists do things that are not martial arts, when they're things of, of incredible uh, passion, and, and we've heard from people who that is medicine in some way or another sport, dance, uh, faith, music. Inevitably, one borrows from the other. Mm -hmm. the, the music is inspired in some way by the martial arts. The martial arts is inspired by the music. I can't imagine that you're going to be the exception to the rule here. So I'm wondering <laughs> in what way has... Are you okay if I collectively refer to it as medicine? Yes, yes. How medicine has influenced your martial arts and how martial arts has influenced your medicine? Oh, man, in, entirely. Like, okay, so if you want to know the next level of martial arts, and I, I'm not even saying you have to go be a doctor or a nurse or a paramedic or any of those things. If you want to learn next level, learn anatomy. Because it's it's... It's very cool to understand if you're going to hit somebody, um, for instance, in the right, underneath the right ribs, okay, right at the bottom of the rib cage there, that's where the liver lives on most people, unless they're a variant. So if you're telling or teaching somebody to hit in this area because it hurts, and they can feel that it hurts, and they know you're right, it's a whole next level to be able to say, I want you to hit specifically the liver under the ribs. You know, it, it just brings it next level. You start understanding, okay, well, whenever I go to do a roundhouse, why do I need to pivot that bottom leg? You know, it's, it's just little things, you know, and break falling. Why do I need to rotate my body a certain direction? You know, so it really will take your martial arts and bring it to the next level. It just, it, it makes you think deeper and then you're able to be very succinct in how you teach. If you teach, um, when it comes to the reverse, if you've ever been adjusted, um, as a, you know, from chiropractic, the motions are very specific. So if you throw, if you throw a punch at somebody and you have a bent wrist, I don't think I have to tell you how that's going to go bad. So if you adjust somebody wrong, you can very much hurt them and yourself. So technique is everything. It, it really does matter on how is their head rotated? Where is your wrist? Where is your hand? Is it in the specific spot? How's the rest of your body? Because you can, you can really mess up somebody else and yourself if you don't know technique. Um, as a paramedic, it completely changed my mindset entirely. You get a very similar high from fighting as you do whenever you're in an emergency situation. Like they're very similar. So being able to handle yourself in an emergency really speaks to how you're going to handle yourself if you ever have to use your martial arts, which I have, and those two worlds have collided um, in the ambulance. And that is an incredible training. That, one? Um, that sounds like a story. Are you I can I can only tell you a limited amount because sure. of patient information. Um, sure. I will tell you that this person was not in their right mind. Um, there was there was two different instances. One was a cocaine addict who had was a very nice guy um, when he wasn't on cocaine, but when he was. He was trouble, and it usually takes multiple people to take him down. Um, and I did have to use some locks that I learned in hot keto in order to hold him in place to get him help, because um, he was a, kind of at a place where he was a little bit dangerous for others. Um, didn't hurt him, but enough to at least control him. Um, the other one was a couple who had decided to cut each other with knives. Um, had to fly one of the people out the other one i put into the ambulance they were acting a little crazy turned out they also had a knife and i had to take the knife from them um so that, that that's 
there's been more than that, but that's all I can say. Yeah, and because uh, it's a patient information, but yeah, I, I get it. Um, totally get it. And you know, HIPAA regs aren't something that you want to no ignore. No. Those lawsuits are, you know, yeah, they can bury you. Yeah, you don't uh, you don't have to be yeah. in the right to file a lawsuit. People forget that. Right, right. <laughs> very, very true. So, out of respect for that, I'm going to say limited. But yeah. the the two worlds very much collide. They're very much a similar high. Um, and honestly, nothing can prepare you for a fight except for a fight. You know, so by by having yourself in that mindset, it really makes you know or really helps you understand how you're going to handle yourself. Hmm. You know, are you able to stay level headed or are you going to freak out? You know, so how did you how did you do that first time? Um, What do you mean? I'm sorry. Well, the, the first time, because I would imagine that, you know, we, we haven't talked about if you've had to use your martial arts training let's say on the street outside of some kind of medical context, but you know, let's put that aside for a moment. Even if you had there, there are times when you don't expect to get in a fight and right. going to work is one of them. Yeah. I, I have never been at my job and thought, huh, looks like something's going to go down about now. Like that, that's, I, and you know, certainly there are people who have professions where that is the case. Law yeah. enforcement, for example. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we, from, from anecdote that I've picked up, it seems like that's happening more and more in a medical context. So yes. that first time where it came up, I, I would imagine that you were shocked, surprised, concerned. Um, you know, what was going through your head and, and, and how did how did that go? To be honest with you, uh, have you ever seen the movie The Last Samurai? Of course. Do you know the scene whenever, and I'm sorry if you guys haven't seen it at this point, but shame on you if you haven't. So yeah, it's, it's been out for a while. It's yeah. Time. Yeah. So there's a, there's a point to where Algren is going to rescue Katsumoto, um, where they've already arrested him. And, you know, he's told, um, I just forgot his name now. I apologize. Okay. Uh, basically those guys are told to follow Algren. Um, if he ever goes towards Katsumoto. And if he does, then they need to kill Algren. Well, the whole fight happens, and Algren takes on, I believe it's five other guys. Um, and then he kind of flashbacks after the fight. Like, the whole thing happens, and then everything slows down to where he realizes that it happened. It was a very similar context to that. I'm not saying that I'm Nathan Algren, but it was it was kind of like that to where it happens so quickly it registers that it happened after the fact training kicks in yes and and honestly so a bit of backstory and i i can't say a lot about this either unfortunately but my father was special forces army so he is our head grandmaster of the school so he is very very serious on whenever we train we train with intent and intensity so that you are prepared for that moment whenever it happens like we we don't have the, the school is very traditional and very intense you know it's it's not sunshine and rainbows we do have good times don't get me wrong but it's it's not about you know everybody being happy all the time he's he's very serious on you know you guys need to be ready so if something does happen you are the one that can respond um and i think because we train that way it prepares them more. You know, nobody can ever be fully prepared until they're in that moment, but we can do everything we can as instructors to at least get them ready. I get it. Yeah. yeah. All right. I know that was kind of a tangent from the question, but we still got there. <laughs> this, every episode we've ever done has been a tangent. Yeah. This this whole, that's, that's the best part about this. The best stuff's on the edges. I, I love it. I love when we wander. And so let's keep wandering. You know, as you've as you've grown up, you know, with martial arts so close to home, so core to your upbringing. I mean, the way you, the way you described your childhood, it was like you were waiting to get back there. And and I, I could imagine that it seems like mm -hmm. we can define what you do as martial arts and other. Yeah, and and now medicine seems to to kind of overlap. You know, the the, the two are. are have some some synergy there right 
So where else has martial arts taken you? You know, you haven't, uh, to my knowledge, saved any, and, and this may come across sarcastically, and I promise it doesn't, I don't mean it this way. You haven't, to my knowledge, prevented any planes from being hijacked. You know, <laughs> your, your original intent for getting in hasn't transpired and, and hopefully never does. Right. But you've continued on. It's become, it sounds like, core to who you are. It so really is. Yeah. Why? Why have you persisted? Why has it led you on this path? I'm sure you've spent some time thinking about it. Yeah, I really have. Um, truthfully, it's it has become... It's ingrained in who I am, yes, but it is also about the other people that I'm surrounded with. You know, I, I had my intent on starting and why I wanted to start. And I am a natural teacher. That is very much who I am. Um, so it's really cool. You know, in a school, you have all these different people, regardless of your size of school, whether it's whether it's two of you or whether it's, you know, 500 of you, you have all these people who have different reasons for being there. So to help them develop them is one of the coolest things in the world. Um, and, you know, I, I think we all start martial arts at some level where it's about the fight or it's about defending yourself. And it is so far beyond translating from that at this point. You know, it, it truly is. It's part of my identity. It's part of who I am. It's about the discipline of yourself and also helping others attain that, you know. So I guess, for instance, like the, the first black belt I was able to produce, um, he was a student of my father's whenever my father was younger and, and he was younger as well. And then, you know, life took him in different directions and he came back and we started training together. He lived in Lake City as well. And if he's listening to this, he knows exactly who he is. Um, and that really kind of helped develop me as a martial artist because he knew that I was a new master and he was patient with me in that development. I knew that he wanted to develop his Hapkido and his skills and he had his reasons for training. So we were really able to, to have a bond there and, you know, life has kind of taken us in different directions. We're still friends to this day. Um, but it, martial arts has a way of doing that. It has a way of bonding people together. And as an instructor, I am so blessed to be able to have the students that I have around me. And I'm blessed to be able to train with my father. I'm blessed that we were able to leave, lead a school like we do. Every one of them have different reasons for training. You know, so like I always tell people, I don't want to create a copy of my hop keto. I want to help you develop your hop keto. There's no reason that you should be like me. You need to be yourself and develop it within that. And that's kind of where martial arts has taken me. You know, it, it started with a plane and being able to help people. And it's still about helping people, but now it's about them helping people. You know, we, we kind of have a saying that we want to develop a community of modern warriors to where like they, they stick up for the little guy, regardless of how they are, or who they are. You know, so I just, I, I love teaching. I love training. And it is so, such a large part of who I am. I have an amazing wife who for years supported me in training. Like she has constantly been there and is now training herself. Oh, nice. Um, Makes it easier. It does. And, you know, we, we had to set some boundaries and some guidelines because, you know, of me being an instructor in the school and her being a student, I think that can very much work, but there has to be boundaries and guidelines. Um, so I'm just, I'm really blessed, man. I'm really just kind of surrounded with this amazing group of people and martial arts has allowed me to meet so many amazing people. Like so many of my heroes that I grew up reading about in newspapers now in magazines, I know them personally. They're they're I could call them friends, you know? So it's just, it, it's, it's crazy to where it's taken me. You know, I, I was, 
middle of nowhere, backwoods Lake City to, you know, knowing all these amazing people in martial arts. It just, it's, I never even thought I would get to do what we're doing now, you know? So I'm incredibly grateful of where it's taken me. It's it's changed my life fully. It's great. Great. And I, I, I can relate to that sentiment as I'm sure you can imagine. Oh yeah. You mentioned warrior and the goal of your school to produce, I think you call them modern warriors. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if, if that's a thing that you all talk about, I imagine that you talk about what it means to be a warrior or at least a modern warrior. And hopefully you might share with us what those conversations sound like, what that definition might be. You know, it's pretty simple. Um, I think it's, it's living by a code. You know, you're, you're not just going off on a whim or what's popular. You don't make the choices that you make because they're popular. You make them because they're right. You stick up for the people who can't stick up for themselves. Um, and perseverance. I mean, I, I think we all have felt that through 2020. I mean, that was, that was a rough year and thank <laughs> God it's behind us. You know, there was nothing magical about the first, but there kind of was at the same time. So, you know, it, it's just, it's about the pursuit. It, it really is. It's, it's about constantly pursuing to make yourself better and the world around you better. Awesome. All right. Now, you mentioned your father, who, and folks may have pieced it together that, you know, when when I said at the top of the show that you've kind of been on the show before, that's that's what I was talking about. You were you were there. You were in the background. If I remember correctly, you were literally on the call the entire time <laughs> as uh, tech support. Yes. So what's changed between then and now? That was two, three years ago. I think it was around two. Okay. Um. So let's let's use that as a a mark in time. And I, I want you to tell us what's changed. Uh, we, we've talked about quite a bit of it, I'm sure. And, and maybe there's nothing here, you know, we'll, we'll go on to something else. But what's changed for you in terms of martial arts? Yeah, so I was recently, um, I, I say recent, it's, I guess it's been a half a year now, but I was recently promoted to sixth degree. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. And with that, also promoted as um, the uh, Secretary General of American Keto Alliance. And I think before that, I was serving as the administrator. So that's, that's where a lot of times I would end up as tech support or, you know, taking care of like the daily activities of the school. And I think it's really cool because in the past few years, um, I'm now living in Port Orange uh, because of going to school here, opening practice here. Um, My father also lives here. So our relationship has really deepened. And I think he is. He has seen how much I truly care about our development in our school and protecting our values. Um, You know, I I have nothing against commercial schools, and that works for some people. Um, That is very much not who we are. You know, if if I had to describe us, we are a very, very old school, um, non-commercial, we care about training. And that's that's just part of what makes the American Hot Keto Alliance the AHA. Like, that's, that's part of who we are. And I hold that in a lot of high esteem. Um, so I think putting so much into the school and and physically living here, my relationship with my father, with our students, has completely deepened and completely changed my life. Um, not to mention my wife training now. So it, it really is ingrained in our household and not just something that we do. Um, yeah. It's it's kind of crazy. Like there, there has been so much 
happened in the past couple of years, especially on the family side. You know, we, we've had um, quite a few dynamic changes in our family on both sides of the family that has been a lot to go through. So the martial arts has really helped us ground in that too. Um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't think that somebody was able to change that much in only a few years, but it very much happened. Well, I, I bet if we go back and, and you know, we, we don't need to unpack this more, but if we go back to, you know, probably halfway through the show when we were talking about normalcy and, and our lack of perspective at times on our own progress, you know, for me, that's one of the beauties of New Year's Day is it's a, you know, it's a line in the sand. Okay. What happened last year? Yeah. What's happening this year? You know, it's a nice opportunity to take a step back and reflect. So let's talk about the future then. How about how about what's coming? What are your, what are your goals? What are you looking forward to, hoping for, fighting to implement? You know, whatever verb fits best there. Man, I've I've got so many things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. Oh, I have goals, my friend. Okay, so um, if you want to talk about like two physical things, uh. There are two things I really, really want to happen. Um, we normally go to the Korea Martial Arts Festival every year. Um, and that has been a totally life-changing thing uh, to meet other martial artists with similar interests. You know, growing up in Backwoods Lake City and then moving here, that, that was kind of the, the first big martial arts event that I was able to go to. Um, and since getting to know... Uh, Chief Master Tom Gordon that runs it. Um, he's allowed, you know, several of us from our school to physically teach there. So it's it's just been, you know, mind blowing. Um, it got canceled last year because of 2020. Um, because COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. But <laughs> but it got canceled. So um, he's currently planning on doing it this year. And we are all excited because, you know, we've made friends there. Uh, I've met a lot of good people there that I continue to stay in contact with that live all over the U.S. Um, so that's that's definitely a goal. I also want to come up to your, um, uh, the Open Martial training Arts day. Training Day. Thank you. I free Training Day. Yes, Free Training that's Day. That's right. You, you um, don't have to. I, I I have to have the words. You're you're allowed to forget the yeah, words. Yeah, words are hard. You know, so. <laughs> they are hard. <laughs> but, Says uh, the doctor. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> too much on the brain, man. Uh, All good. But yes, I really want to do that. Um, now that I'm in practice, you know, that may be able to actually happen. Um, something else I would like to do long term. And I, I, I'm still working out the details of this. Uh, you know how throughout the world there's destination training camps um, to where like you can go like you can go to this Taekwondo training camp and yeah. pay X amount of dollars. What I would really like to do um, is to develop a facility in which martial arts schools can rent them for their own camps. Hmm. So have have like training areas you know outdoor outdoor training areas indoor um lodging you know somewhere that they they literally pay a flat fee and they go to this area and they're able to use that as a destination training i think i think something like that would be really really cool in a an event facility that is specially catered instead of having big banquet halls that you have to roll in mats and bring the chairs yes. out there's yes. just always mats and no chairs. Yes, it is. It is made for I'm martial game. arts. Take all of my money. <laughs> Let's do it. Yes, I, I'm serious. And if any of you out there copy my idea, please don't. <laughs> this is not something I have copyrighted, but it is something I've had in my in my mind for a while. And I think honestly, with what we've gone through in the past year, it has made all of us realize how important. Um, community is and I think to be able to do training camps and stuff like that only deepens those communities so I think it's it's really important to do something like that I'm still working out details um, and of course you know there's 
there's liability things and everything to figure out along with that. But that is definitely a long term goal that I have in mind. Um, well, I, I hope I you do get it off the ground. And, and I'll be honest, if if there's room for one, there's room for far more than one. Yeah. Millions of martial artists just in the U.S. And, you know, there are there are destination trainings. Um, oh, yeah. It was uh, uh, Master Ian Armstrong, and I believe it was 438. No, I don't have them all memorized. I, I quickly checked before I <laughs> said anything. Has a, a, a retreat, a Kung Fu retreat in Thailand. Yes. You know, these things do exist. Yes. Uh, but what's different about yours that you're talking about is that it's kind of, I would call it hot swappable for different groups. Yeah. And I think that that's super fun. Yeah. It, it, it's almost, you know, just literally a facility that you can use. Yeah. And I have a couple of spots in mind. I don't want to give those away. Um, but I have a couple of spots in mind that I would really like to do something like that in. It, you know, I'm looking, it will be in Florida. Um, so I'll kind of leave it at that, but, uh, well, let, you know, yeah. once we're done, let's talk it. Cause I, I've done some work in a different enough, but similar vein that I can might be able to lend some thoughts. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I've learned one of the best ways to, to get your goals just is to speak it into existence yes. because it helps you realize that it's real. And then it also will help introduce you to the people who can help you get there. You know, none none of us, you know, build this empire in a day. Like it takes one person with an idea, but then they usually need people to help them. And how are you going to make it? How are you going to do it if you can't even talk about it? Exactly. If you're, not, if you're not willing to talk about it, if you're too embarrassed to say what you're doing, how are you going to do it? How are you going to feel when you take that first step and people look at you funny? Exactly. Like, I, I'm sure you went through the same thing at the beginning of Whistle Kick. It was an idea. Past tense? You know. <laughs> it's still going on, my friend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very much so, but it took that it took that first initial big step. I mean, man, you want to talk about freaking? Whenever I decided, I mean, I'm not old, but whenever you decided to go back to school and you've already had a career, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to restart. That's scary. I mean, it it's a quarter of a million of student loans. Mm -hmm. That's a scary thing to step into. A lot of money, yeah. but it takes that initial step out. You know, it takes that initial step out to get off the couch and go find a school and train, you know, awesome. anyways. Yeah. Tangent. <laughs> it's all tangent. If people want to find you, you know, website, social, all that stuff, you know, where, where, what would they type into the interwebs? Okay. So from the chiropractic perspective, um, I'm working at radiant health chiropractic in Port Orange, um, Port Orange, Florida. If you Google it, it will come up. Um, but that's where you can find me there. Uh, I really, really, I mean, I love working with everyone. Um, there is no patient I don't like working with, honestly. <laughs> Give it time. But yeah, for now, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I really love working with martial artists because they really understand what we do. And I love working with medical professionals because they ask all the right questions. Um, they, they challenge me to be better, and I love it. I think it's a good thing. Um, we also run... I'm on Facebook. Um, we run the American Hump Keto Alliance on Facebook. We actually have our own page. Um, that is how I would recommend getting in contact with me. Um, that's really kind of the best way. Uh, it will either be me or my wife responding. And also, I... Recently started producing some YouTube videos. They are not high budget, expensive videos. Um, but what my whole goal was is to explain different concepts in martial arts and why do they work anatomically? You know, there, there's a lot of those out for like sports and stuff, but I, could, I couldn't find anything like that for martial arts. I checked. So explaining the theories behind it, why does it work? Um, so if you type Nikolai Lee, N-I-K-O-L-A-I, Lee, L-E-E, -E, martial arts on YouTube, you'll find a few videos there as well. Um, I'm not related to Bruce Lee, differently. <laughs> <laughs>
but a shame. but I wish I could say that. That would be super cool. Then we then I would ask you, and and I wouldn't because Shannon Lee's been on the show, so people know I I, I don't do this. But <laughs> the joke would be, well, you know, then we wouldn't talk about you. Yeah, we'd talk about him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No offense to the Lees, they're fantastic, but I'm a different Lee. Um, but yeah, that's where you can find that. Awesome. Mm-hmm. All right, and you know, you know how we 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 do this next part, so. How do you want to close out? You know, what final words do you have for the folks listening? Um, so, so here's where I stand on, on this. There are different ways about going, um, about going to martial arts. Okay. So there are some who really, really devote. And I think you actually did an episode on this. Um, there are some that really, really devote their life's work to one art. And then there are some that devote their life's work to being in as many arts as possible. Um, and they're for two totally different reasons. You know, some want to be very, very well-rounded, and that's a beautiful thing, and you should be. Um, others want to truly master something. Um, I would fall into the category of trying to truly master hot keto. Um, I have not studied uh, any other arts, but hot keto. Um, but I've made that my life's work. So what I do instead of closing myself off only to hot keto, I constantly seek out other martial arts and go hang out with them, go work out with them, go experience something that you don't normally experience. You need that exposure. Um, you know, uh, about a year ago, we found an Aikido school that isn't far from where we live. And we got together with them because they share a common lineage. And there was a lot of things that were similar. I've gone to BJJ schools. I've gone to a Capoeira school. I've gone to Pai Chan's um, Kung Fu school in Orlando. Uh, you know, just whatever I can do to be exposed is what I like. So I, I really want to master what I do and expose myself to others. So I guess my final word would be to be a sponge. You know, you need to respect everyone, regardless of their rank, regardless of their age, regardless if they've been training for one day, 30 minutes, or 80 years. Because I guarantee you they have something to teach you. It might be what you don't want to do. You know, you'll learn something about how you react to that person or they'll teach you, you know, we're, we're so used to, oh, you know, somebody does a, you know, front kick reverse punch and they land with that front kick forward. Well, that's not exactly how the world works. And white belts don't know that. So they're, they, they will react very, very different than the person who's been trained to fight. Or like if, if somebody's, you know, you need a good uki, somebody who can take a fall. And the white belt doesn't know how to fall. You know, you need that. You need to know how the normal person's going to react. So be a sponge, really just kind of soak in knowledge and then throw away what you don't need. Throw away what doesn't work with you. So that was kind of a long answer to your question, but it got, we got there. <laughs> One of my favorite things about this show is how it's connected me to so many people in so many places. I have friends all over the world, folks that, I feel like I know them, even though I've never met them. Maybe you feel the same about some of the people or, you know, honestly, from some of the emails I get, some of you feel that way about me. And it's a lot of fun. It's one of my favorite things about this world that we live in today. So I don't think there's any other way, any better way for me to say thank you to Dr. Lee than thank you. I I appreciate your friendship and your support. And thanks for coming on the show. If you want more, head over to whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. Every episode has a page all to itself with the links, photos, a transcript, and sometimes even more. If you're down to support us in all of our work, you have lots of options. You can make a purchase at whistlekick.com. You could also leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, help out with our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you see somebody out there wearing something with whistlekick on it, say hello. If you've got feedback or suggestions, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. And I'm done for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 